I kind of open the book talking about these two photographs because it frames quite um, nicely Lozano's trajectory, which is that she arrives in New York in 1960, um, determined to become an artist. And unlike many of her peers at that time, she didn't ever have another job. She wasn't a museum guard. She didn't teach. She um, was just focused on her work. And 10 years later, in 1970, she announces that she is going to drop out of the art world for good. And a few months later, having dropped out, she announces that from that point on she's going to boycott all other women. And for the rest of her life, she died in 1999, Lozano didn't, um, made no contact with the art world and didn't speak to women until she, until she died. Because she was a conceptual artist by the late 60s, her career is short but fascinating because she kind of mirrored <coughs> many of the New York art world's main movement. So she begins as quite an outrageous pop artist doing very lurid, funny, um, pop-like drawings of bodies and body parts uh, mingled with tools. I'll show you some of those. By mid-decade, she's really beginning to first begin to regain, gain um, a reputation as an abstract painter. But by the late 60s, she moves. Away. She continues to paint, but she moves into conceptual art life practices in, in common with many, many of her peers at this time. So she would undertake various activities, tests, and so on, that she would set herself experiments and investigations. She called them, and she would write them up on sheets of graph paper that would then be displayed. So by the late 60s, conceptual art was the dominant mode, really, in New York. Um, she was good friends with Richard Serra um, and with many of the other conceptualists who were then working with text rather than image. But alongside those, she kept this amazing series of 11 private notebooks, um, as well as just piles of papers. Some are torn up scraps, some are carefully written up loose leaf sheets, which I um, was lucky enough to spend lots of time digging through her archives with. Well, it's been really important to me that I sort of situate her in relationship to, that I put her into context, because she's a very idiosyncratic, quite a renegade character, but she is also very much of her time, and it's quite important, it's very important to understand that, because if not she becomes sort of this crazy outsider and we don't know what to do with her, and I, I think in a way that's um, sort of been part of the problem of um, rehabilitating her, is not knowing what to do with her. For me, there's a moment in the last chapter which I sort of try and situate her in relationship to the women's movement. She really was clear that she rejected feminism. I'm not a feminist. She would write in her notebooks, but she would always turn up to, um, she would often turn up to meetings um, organised by Lucy Lippard and by the uh, other artists who were trying to organise on behalf of the women's movement and I thought of her as this kind of sort of Bartleby like figure because of course you can just stop working and leave you can drop out and um, you can go to California lots of other artists did this they simply refused the art world and left this is a familiar thing of tune in turn on and drop out but she didn't she kind of stuck around um, as a kind of irritant um, showing up and making trouble and in that way, she sort of belongs to another renegade group of what became known as radical feminists in the late 60s and early 70s, who were similarly um, celebrated and castigated for variously, um, you know, you shouldn't put the individual above the collective. So as soon as someone like Kate Millett or Shula McFirestone publishes a really important book for the movement, they would be sort of... Uh, trashed by the sisterhood for signing their name as an individual when we should be a movement. 